Greetings to all in the love and light of the one infinite creator. My name is Jonathan Tong and I'm facilitator for the Seattle Law of One study group. We can be found on the list of study groups on the LNL research webpage shown on your screen. We can also be found on Facebook. We do actually meet on Zoom on Tuesdays from 3.30 to 5 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. And we did also uh, join, uh, add most recently a Saturday session from 7.30 to 9 in the morning. Pacific Standard Time, uh, which is a more convenient time for folks who are living in European time zones. You don't have to live in Seattle or near Seattle to join our Facebook group or to join our Zoom sessions. Anyone who is interested and available is welcome to join. We do uh, also have a YouTube channel where you can find recordings of previous Q&A sessions. Um, all are welcome to uh, watch those and enjoy. And today we are blessed to be joined by uh, Gary Bean and Trisha Bean and Austin Bridges, joining us for some informal conversation and Q&A about the Law of One. Uh, all three are on the LNL research team that uh, along with Jim McCarthy has been channeling the entity known as Quo roughly twice a month for the last 40 years or so. Welcome to all three of you. How are you doing today? Doing very well. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, thanks so much for inviting us here again. It's always such an honor to be with you and your group. Ditto, and uh, great to see you again. We finally got to meet you in person at the homecoming gathering in Louisville uh, this past September. So I uh, feel a little bit more uh, familiarity with you now and closeness. So it's great to be here. Yeah, and thank you for having me. I'm nervous and excited, and it's uh, awesome to see some familiar faces too. So mm -hmm. thank you. <laughs> yeah, such a, a joy and a delight to see uh, everyone here. Thank you all for uh, joining us on, on the call. I did want to start off uh, by acknowledging that I think all three of you have expressed at some point concerns about not wanting to be put on a pedestal as channels or to be seen as some sort of great spiritual authorities. Uh, but rather fellow seekers. Uh, uh, did any of the three of you want to add to that before we go deeper into our questions and answers? Uh, yeah, I will uh, rip on that for just a moment and clarify that the law of one is a vast and sophisticated and advanced philosophy, I would say, and no one can claim expert level status, um, including us. We have years of study to bring to the table and we'll do our best to offer our reflections here. But each one of us holds a unique and valuable perspective about the law of one. And we learn from others as much as um, as much as much our own studies. So uh, we're honored to be here uh, among equals. And uh, thanks for that prompt, Jonathan. Indeed. Yeah, much appreciated. Uh, and with the three of you here, I think when we ask questions, um, I'll leave it up to the three of you to balance the time equally oh, yeah. and equitably and all that stuff. And if folks feel uh, compelled to share something, feel free to. And if you don't necessarily have anything to add, then that's fine too. Uh, I did want to start off by asking about current events because I believe as of yesterday, the uh, transcript was uh, published for the channeling session that happened just over a week ago on uh, November 10th from the CC channeling group. For folks who are not quite up on what the CC channeling group was or maybe what the purpose of that particular session was, uh, could someone uh, uh, elaborate a little bit on that session, what it was about and how it went? Can I go first on that? Yeah, so, um... You may be aware that uh, Trish Austin and I, along with another local friend, Kathy, have been part of a channeling circle that has been uh, channeling now, like you said, Jonathan, semi-monthly for several years now. We've had one limitation with that channeling, and that's that um, we channel in reply to questions that are curated for their suitability for the contact. And we've asked lots of great, great questions, but we know in advance that they're going to be suitable. However, now we're at the precipice of the start of the public meditations where um, you know, people will gather in Jim's living room and um, ask questions that may not be suitable for the contact, including 
um, questions that may the Confederation can't slash won't answer because they may infringe on free will, um, or questions that take the instrument far outside their comfort zone in terms of being far beyond the knowledge base of the instrument, which is a limitation inherent in conscious channeling going all the way back to Carla's years as well. So what we did with this recent session was to simulate the public meditations by asking questions that would get us as instruments outside of our comfort zone. Fascinating. So that was the experiment that you were referring to in the transcript? Nice. So how did it uh, feel? Any of the three of you feel uh, uh, care to comment on how that experiment went for you? Go ahead, Trish. Yeah, I hadn't, uh, to be honest, I hadn't put too much thought into it prior to the session itself. And um, as it began, and I was like the final channel, uh, the final instrument, uh, it was very scary at first, a little bit uncomfortable because you know that these questions are purposefully curated to test you um, and challenge you. Uh, so there was some discomfort with that, and that's reflection of one's own insecurity, probably. Um, and then kind of feeling a little elated afterwards, knowing that we were able to uh, mm -hmm. speak to these questions to some extent. And um, yeah, kind of felt like finishing a 5K <laughs> a little bit. Like that was really uncomfortable, but that was awesome. <laughs> Or feeling like having done a, what did you say, a fourth grade book report on what <laughs> yeah. <fourth> read yet? <laughs> yes, <laughs> like that. Wearing your father's business suit at the same time or something. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it was great to see this instrument's humor come through, too. She is. Yeah. Funny. Oh, I think we all enjoyed the humor that came through in that session. And I think some people were going to ask or uh, comment about it. Now that we know that uh, uh, Quo's recommended source for news is the Cartoon Network, <laughs> as opposed to ESPN. It was nice. Enjoyed the humor there. Uh, Austin, would you care to comment on, I mean, how the session felt for you and uh, how the humorous aspects uh, felt to you? Yeah, it felt really great. And it was uh, an important thing because the coming public meditations are going to be a pretty big shift for us. Uh, we've been channeling isolated among the channeling circle in Jim's living room for years now. It's the only way that we've known to channel. So we needed the practice and you know things are going to be shifting up a bit, the dynamic will change. And that's always exciting, but it's always a bit nerve wracking. So having that practice in uh, has been great. We also did a bit of a practice with our last intermediate circle as well. So then the next time that we channel, it will be in a public meditation setting with a living room, uh, probably packed full of people. Wow. Uh, as far as the humor goes, yeah, there's um, a great aspect of the channeling that uh, if you're familiar with the channeling archives, it was never absent from Carla's channeling. Um, you know, Carla herself had a lot of wit, but through Carla, Kuo, and especially uh, entities like Latui were able to imbue a lot of humor uh, in their channeling and what they offered. I think, Jonathan, you've actually spoken about this recently in the study sessions, right? Um, like humor is a big aspect of what they offer. So it was uh, good to allow that to break open a little bit. And hopefully that continues to you know grow and we feel comfortable like settling in with that as we channel. Yeah, I would think it helps to diffuse a fair bit of the tension and nervousness that, that might otherwise be there. Cannot really say thank you enough to uh, the three of you and to Kathy and Jim for all you do in channeling for, for service to others. That's uh, must be an extremely difficult discipline to uh, engage in and doing it in front of strangers <laughs> it's, yeah. adds a whole nother level of stress that I, I can't even comprehend. So uh, deep heartfelt thanks uh, on behalf of all of us uh, for, for doing that. Uh, yeah, and I did uh, want to go ahead and turn to the group for questions because I do see a number of folks have questions in the chat window. Um, let's see, and I am looking 
actually, if we don't mind, maybe we can stay on the uh, November 10th channeling session because I know there were a couple of folks who had questions about that. Uh, Bill, would you like to unmute your mic and ask uh, at least one of your questions? Is Bill there? Yeah, I'm here. Um, yeah, my thing. Um, uh, thanks for being here, especially you, Tricia. Um, they say you have a hard time ha dealing with people <laughs> or crowds. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, public speaking and stuff can be nerve wracking. Um, yeah, I was just, uh, I, I was, it was a remarkable session you guys did. I mean, from uh, like, like uh, Tom just said about the Adult Swim, uh, Adult Swim, Cartoon Network uh, Comet, and um, but I, I noticed that they said that 33% of the people incarnating today are dual activated. I mean, that to me, that's like a remarkable uh, shift in the um, planetary energies. I mean, uh, what, what did you guys think about that when they said that? Because it really shows, you know, because in a lot of the uh, other uh, confederation sources they say not a lot of people are gonna polarize uh you know or graduate into the next density so it would seem that with these amount of positive i mean uh, dual activated entities coming in this place is really i mean going for density a lot quicker than it seems would you comment on that I've got thoughts, but I want to check in with Austin. Uh, do you want me to say something first? No, I'm wondering if uh, uh, if you have something that you really want to say. No, go for it. Okay, true. Okay. Um, yeah, so firstly, uh, I was the instrument who channeled that, and even I don't take that as hard truth necessarily. That may very well have been accurately channeled and literally true or may not have. If you recall in, in that channeling, um, they quo riffed on my own discomfort with hard facts. And even before my own time channeling, listen to, listening to Carla channeling, I took that sort of information with a grain of salt because the um, human instrument is coloring and biasing that information. The conscious channeling is uh, qualitatively different from something like the raw contact because in the case of the raw contact, you're hearing from the source directly. In conscious channeling, the human instrument is participating in the process and closing the process. So that's what popped up for me was as an instrument was that number, 33%. And the the um, the objective of channeling is to speak what comes to you <laughs> and trust and try not to analyze and try not to get in the way of that channeling. Uh, but to your, your greater question, um, whether that 33% is literally accurate or it's somewhere in the range, um, I think it does point to a shifting demographics, shall we say, and does point to the prospect of maybe, as Ra indicated, not taking 700 years to reach some critical mass whereby a third density shifts into fourth density. But uh, I personally, at the, I distill it down, to distill it down for me, I took hope from that piece of information. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Austin, Trish, did you have anything to add to that? Just one quick comment. Um, like Gary was saying, I agree with everything about taking facts like that. I also take them with a grain of salt, uh, even prior to us channeling. There was a point in the past a few years ago, maybe more than 10 years ago, where Carla channeling had mentioned that, or Kuo through Carla mentioned that every child being born was a dual activated entity. And uh, so we were, after that session, we were trying to do the math and figure out, does that add up to maybe 33% since that point in time? Um, but if it is true, then yeah, that primarily that 33%, I think would be children and probably very young children as well. And um, I can believe that, I think, based on, you know, uh, the spirit that I see in younger generations today and um, the sort of evolutionary thinking, and especially with like compassion and equality as a 
very central focus, I think. Um, it's believable to me, I think. Makes sense to me too. Yeah, appreciate that. Uh, Trish, did you have anything to add? Any thoughts to share on that? Please. Yeah, I appreciate it. It, it reminds me, um, you know, there at some, would it be fair to say that part of the reason that you chose to ask that question as part of this experiment was that asking questions related to numbers like that is not really the kind of question that you would consider uh, a, a worthy question to ask. It seems more transient, perhaps, or not really of spiritual significance. Would that be fair to say? Partly, yeah. So I was the one who asked that question. And for more context on this session, we did ask questions in this session that we typically wouldn't ask in a channeling session. So um, there were a few different angles to why I asked that question. One was that, you know, the idea of like asking about numbers and specific numbers is a bit transient. Um, Ra was pretty happy to give numbers like that uh, without remarking on whether they were important or not but it's also i knew that it would make gary uncomfortable <laughs> when he was channeling that and so that was part of why i asked and also knowing that channeling specific numbers like that like my experience of channeling is it's a lot easier to allow the concepts to flow through and be painted with this language that you get into when you're channeling but when it comes to pulling specifics like numbers uh, that's something that is kind of outside the bounds of what we've experienced and i know that it is possible through channeling but we haven't practiced that kind of thing before and so that was another reason why i asked that because it's a like gary was saying it's not a conscious channeling isn't necessarily the best way to do something like that and um you know we might get questions like that as we open it more up in the public meditations yeah i appreciate your sharing that because there was a question that i had considered submitting for for uh consideration basically like asking about what percent of our planetary population has consciously chosen the service to others path what percent has consciously chosen the service to self path roughly what percent of our current planetary population is harvestable on either of those um, but i'm gathering for what you're saying that's not really a question that you would normally ask in such a session i personally don't think it's harmful and it can be interesting um so but it's not something that i personally would typically focus on in a channeling session so yeah it was unusual for me to ask that nice. Yeah, I think we all uh, ask it. Big, I ask it only because I think it came up in one of our study group sessions one time where we we're just trying to get an idea of how good does one have to be to be harvestable to the fourth density positive? How bad does one have to be to be harvestable in the negative path? Because I believe the examples that Ra gave in the original Ra contact were pretty extreme in both directions, either Catholic saints on the positive side or Nazi war criminals on, on the negative side. I'm just wondering, wow, that seems like a fairly high bar to reach. But uh, as you're saying, I think the numbers are perhaps not really the, the, the point of this. Uh, I appreciate your sharing. Uh, Trisha, if you don't mind, I, I had a question on a different tack uh, that I was curious to hear your thoughts on. Uh, a while ago, at one of our earlier Q&A sessions, uh, Gary and Austin had both spoken about just what it feels like to make contact with Quo with a fourth, fifth, sixth density conglomeration of social memory complexes. And I would assume it's it's pretty different for each person. But I think they described it, both of them, I think, described it as a very warm feeling, the feeling of being in the presence of a friend or a family member and a feeling almost of, of being hugged by that entity when you're uh channeling and you're making contact does it feel similar to you or different how how does making contact with quo feel to you yeah i would say um the warmth the sensation of feeling welcomed and held uh is something that i experience when i uh, make contact i would also say it feels on a very um, sensory, central level, very high energy, high vibration, like actually feeling like on a body level 
an intense surge of energy, especially focused uh, in the head, between the eyes. But um, yeah, warm, comfortable, a little bit scary the first time because you don't really expect to feel this high energy, uh, welcoming, high energy and welcoming simultaneously. Um, but yes, it's um, it's a new kind of comfort, I suppose, one that I hadn't experienced before attempting to channel. And uh, especially even between the different Confederation voices that we've channeled, Quo to me also feels like the biggest surge of energy when contact is established. Um, yeah, and there's also kind of different energetic vibes between the different voices too, in terms of um, how it feels like, am I feeling a bit more of a creative uh, input? Am I feeling more of a humorous input? Am I feeling more logical? At least in my experience, that's oh, how that's it's fascinating. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Is the twee the humorous one? I. I can't remember. It's been a while since we've channeled Hatan or Latwee, but I do. I feel like Hatan was one that felt the most accessible, at least. Like maybe Hatan and I are uh, on a similar wavelength. <laughs> we speak the same language. Um, yeah. Yeah. It might, maybe Latwee was humorous. Quo obviously feels the most poetic, I think um that's so beautiful i mean that would make sense for hatan if hatan if i remember right is fourth density density of love and would seem perhaps the most close to our level the most yeah level. so when you describe the feeling of the energy is it like any other high energy feeling that you can compare it to or is it really of its own nature unique i think it's unique but similar a similar experience would be um, like the rush one feels when they're either extremely nervous, and that could be just my nerves, <laughs> or um, surprised or exhilarated is like the closest I've, I could put it to. Um, and mm -hmm. on a physical level, there's kind of like, at least for me, a, a palpitation of the heart, um, a sense of like maybe getting a little head dizzy at times. Yeah, but otherwise it's pretty unique. Yeah, I cannot imagine, which is why I'm asking. Does it feel more or less the same way each time? Does it become a familiar sensation so that in subsequent channeling sessions, it's like, oh, okay, I know this feeling in it perhaps even you can recognize it as a solid contact because it has that same vibrational energetic fingerprint. Absolutely. I, I would say for me, it's a pretty, I mean, obviously whenever we tune, we challenge whatever contact we get. Um, and if I still feel that way after challenging, I feel very extremely comfortable knowing that I've, you know, I've made contact with, who it says I have established contact with. So yeah, to me, it's a guidepost. It's a, it's concrete. Yes, this, I've gotten this feeling. I know this feeling. Therefore, I can be uh, absolutely sure to the extent that one can be sure. Yeah, well, that's beautiful. Thank you for uh, sharing. Mm -hmm. uh, Gary Austin, did you have anything to add to that? I know we've spoken about it before, but do you have anything to add? Not for me. That's good. Thank you. Hey, uh, I do see a lot of questions in the chat window, and I do want to make sure that we get to all of those questions. So uh, if you don't mind, I think I'll just go in the order that I am seeing them. Josh, uh, did you have a question? Would you like to unmute your mic and ask? Yes. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thanks. Thank you, Gary, Trish, and Austin for uh, being here and your service of answering our questions and continuing to channel Quo. So thanks for that. My question is, I was wondering, of all the Confederation members that you've channeled, 
um, other than Quo, who is your favorite and why? Of the ones that we've channeled, we've mostly channeled Kuo for the most part. Early on, we had channeled Latos, and I can't remember specifically who else came through. Um, so aside from Kuo, um, Latos is the one that I remember the most, just because it was how we first started channeling, uh, first started learning. Um, but if it were ones that we did not channel, obviously Ra is my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> Easy one. Yeah. Of the conscious channeling, I would say the tweet is I don't know that we channeled the tweet, did we? I thought we did. Maybe yeah, I just spoke on the last question. Uh, but in terms of the archives, I missed the tweet. There was a uh, precision there or like a wit and a sharpness or acuity of of intellect, I would say. I like it. <laughs> Patan's your boy. Patan is my homeboy. <laughs> <laughs> that belongs on a t-shirt. <laughs> I'm pretty sure. <laughs> Put it on the L and L research uh, merch <laughs> site. You will sell. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's a, a great question. Thank you for sharing that. Um, and should probably uh, clarify. Uh, maybe all three of you. Would you mind uh, sharing how many years you've been channeling? Uh, maybe starting with Austin, how many years? Um, we all started at the same time, and that was in 2017, right? I think so. It's, memory's very fuzzy. Um, like maybe late 2016, early. Yeah, late wow. 2016. So about six years now is uh, six years ago, we started learning. And the very first learning sessions that we did, they're not transcribed or uh, on the website. Uh, so you won't find those but yeah we started learning from jim and steve in 2016. and carla held a series of workshops in 2008 onward i don't remember how many six seven uh, weekend intensives and i went through those initially intent or at least attempting to channel but i gave up on it then at that time feeling i wasn't ready and it wasn't for me Oh, that's right. Yeah. Wow, that's amazing. Uh, not that long a time. Yeah, six, seven years. Not not that long a time. Amazing the the growth. I would imagine that you've all seen since then. Uh, Linda, I saw had a question. Linda, would you like to unmute your mic and ask your question? Yeah, uh, Trish, I am really glad to see that you've joined the guys. I like getting a female perspective. I think it's yeah. wonderful. So thank you for being here. Thank you. Uh, my question is uh, basically living the law of one. I'm rereading it. And I came to this uh, statement by Carla, because we are at the very end of this density of choice, our time to become aware and make our decision to polarize is limited. We have until the winter solstice of 2012 to do so. And then she goes on to say, I take this date seriously. I do not believe the world will end, but I do believe that um, basically she said, after 2012, those who live here on earth in third density will be focusing on the stewardship of the planet. There is quite a few of the callers here. This was 10 years ago that she stated that the time was done to make the choice that we're not even aware of the fact that they had to make a choice, so to speak. Do you believe, as Carla did, that right now the time for choice is over and done and that basically we're just kind of here uh, to continue on with what we are doing? I'd just like to know what you all think. <laughs> Emphatic disagreement there. <laughs> And this, uh, I'm not too sure why she so settled on that date in that particular way. It does seem like an important inflection point for a, a variety of reasons, but I think I would say our basic opinion at our research is that so long as we're breathing third density air, we can do the work of polarizing our consciousness. And um, regarding Carla's sort of forecast that the human population beyond that date would all be positively oriented and 
um, intent upon stewarding the planet. <laughs> uh, I think any look at the daily news would quickly dispel uh, that notion because whether in our political, economic, or um, uh, other realms of human activity, that seems not to be the case among the, you know, the predominant cultures and predominant trends. It is definitely ongoing. It's just a bit under the radar, I would say. But um, yeah, even, you know, we're dealing with energies of autocracy being on the rise and ecological uh, degradation with the potential of collapse too. We're still on a, a, a self-destructive trajectory, I, I would say. Sorry, long answer. I had took it to mean that not everybody would be positively polarized. I took it her to mean that if you had not made the choice at that point to become positively polarized, that you were going to be stuck in whatever loop you were in until you finished this incarnation. Yeah, just, go ahead. Arson. Yeah, that doesn't seem true. I mean, I know that I have made some kind of progress in the past 10 years i would hope that most people feel similarly i know that i've seen people that seem to be polarizing positively in the past 10 years and it doesn't make logical sense to me that none of that is actually real that none of it is true so i base my understanding on what i see what i feel what i witness um regarding that specific statement some years after that after carla had passed jim uh wrote a note to insert into uh the book 101 so your copy might be old without the note um it's at the beginning called a note about 2012 and he just explains his understanding of why carla said this and what he believes carla's reaction would be to you know that date having come and gone and and one final comment um i started my seeking journey several years before 2012 and if anybody else was seeking at that time you might remember that like the spiritual especially the new age community was like whipped up into a frenzy as 2012 approached like most people I knew didn't or placed at least some sort of significance on that date as something that they thought something significant was going to happen and I think uh like almost everybody else Carla was probably caught up in that wave of anticipation and interpreted it in the way that she did in the book and I do think uh there was something that happened in 2012 I don't think that it was something that shifted so significantly that we can't polarize anymore. Um, it just doesn't make logical sense to me. Great, thank you for, for, I just wanted to hear your thoughts on that. Obviously Morris was straight along that line with you and I just <laughs> wanted to hear if you were also, thanks. So good to see you, Linda and Morris, and thank you for the great yeah. question. And uh, one final nuance, and I, I think Carla's mindset also may have grown out of Don's orientation because you see that sort of mentality in his questioning of Ra, of expecting that in you know 30 years hence, you know, third density is going to be no more. Thanks. Yeah, it's probably worth noting also, I mean, in time scale, years and months and decades are all relative. And if you think about how the world has changed just in the last 10 years since 2012, it's like, yeah, there's a lot of significant changes yeah. that have happened since then. So there may still be something to it. Uh, Prashant, I saw you had a question about plant medicines. Would you like to unmute your mic and ask? Hey, thanks. Uh, hi, Gary. Austin and uh, Trish, uh, really nice connecting with you guys. Uh, so I'm connecting from India here. Uh, so just wanted to ask a question regarding plant medicine. Is there any mention either in course channeling or probably in Ra's channeling about plant medicine? And uh, also uh, in line with that, a uh, lot of people say they have psychedelic experiences, etc. So how much in line is it with respect to a positively polarized person? Thank you. Great question. Either of you guys want to take it first? Go for it. Sounds like a good one for you, Gary. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, LSD is mentioned in the Law of One, and Ra says specifically that um, that particular chemical substance doesn't explain why, but can open the gateway to intelligent infinity. And, you know, that bears out in testimony and personal experience with others. And um, plant medicines were, I think, I am no expert on our vast archive of channelings, but I know questions about plant medicines have been asked. 
And um, my general takeaway from the Confederation is that yes, these can be powerful uh, technologies in consciousness that can help one, um, but that can help to facilitate uh, healing, self-understanding, self-acceptance, uh, reprogramming even of the consciousness. However, um, my general takeaway is that 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 um, viewpoint comes with a caveat that because these are powerful, they can accelerate the evolution. And if the self isn't ready to integrate that increased light that these technologies have made available, then that light can be very destructive to the self. It can disarrange the self. It can disintegrate the self. Um, also, the Confederation Council's a generally uh, organic shall I say, approach to spiritual evolution, whereby the self sources their journey from within and discovers re resilience and self-reliance and processing one's catalyst. Um, that said, I think that these are amazing technologies. And um, if used very carefully with you know right set and setting, in a ritualistic ceremonial uh, sort of space, preferably even with a guide, depending on uh, what substances are used, that they can open doorways um, to healing. And I will end by saying, Trish and I um, took all of our wedding money and used it to go to Peru, <laughs> uh, where we saw Machu Picchu and Cusco, of course, but we also spent a week in the Amazonian rainforest uh, outside of Iquitos in northern Peru, where we attended a shamanic retreat and underwent several ayahuasca ceremonies. And uh, it was done with integrity and um, with compassion and care and with expertise. I was really grateful for the experience. Uh, I am highlighting it because the ayahuascaro there emphasized that this is just the beginning. The insights that you're getting um need to be processed and integrated over the long term in your journey once you go home and after each ceremony we the next the following day we would have a cleansing ritual and we would get together in a circle where everybody could speak to their experience and process it and share it as a group so there was um integration and and care and there was respect given to the substance uh too it, you know it wasn't uh, a recreational <laughs> by whatsoever. It wasn't a party atmosphere. It was for doing work in consciousness uh, specifically. But anyway, mm. uh, thanks for being here from India. That's amazing. Trisha, would you care to share anything from your ayahuasca experience? I would imagine there's a lot of folks who would be, would love to hear your uh, thoughts on that. Yeah, um, I was um, unfortunately unable to uh, ingest the plant medicine. I had been in the hospital a couple weeks or a month prior, I think, um, and had to take medicine that would be contraindicated with uh, the plant medicine. But to speak to um, intention, I still attended all of these ceremonies and did not ingest the plant medicine and still had great, powerful lessons to learn and um, lots to integrate and process myself without taking a drink once. And um, so, yeah, I, I think plant medicine is like amazing. I heard so many stories at this retreat about people healing relationships that they had with other people, healing relationships that they had with themselves, hmm. um, healing the way that they viewed the world. Um, and that's amazing. But it's also possible without the plant medicine too in my instance and she got to listen to a symphony of vomit yeah without the benefit of being on the plant yeah <laughs> <laughs> an entirely different story to be shared for <laughs> yeah Prashant, did you have any follow-up questions to that that was a great question was there anything you wanted to follow up with uh, this is not Lou, the same question. So do we want to go ahead with other people's questions? And if we have time, we can maybe come back to my question or should I show it now? Would be glad to. 
Yeah, thank you. Uh, you might have to remind me in case I forget, because <laughs> there's a lot of questions. Uh, Donna, I see you have a question. Would you like to unmute your mic and ask? Yes, thank you. Hi, uh, Austin, Gary, Trish. Hey, um, so, hey <laughs> some of my questions kind of been answered, but I was wondering, because you seem like over the last decade or so, or maybe when you guys started channeling that, um, it's predominantly the principle of quo that comes through. And I was wondering when you're challenging, is that the only one that comes through or do the parts like Latouille and Hatton or even other confederation sources come through and, or was that an agreement you worked out? And then the second part of my question is, do you ever plan on doing another channeling intensive and um, to train people for either with your circle or circles up elsewhere or maybe doing something over Zoom? You know, have you ever tried that before? Um, very good question. And hi, Donna. It's good hey. to see you. <laughs> nice to see you. Um, in terms of the aspect of challenging and whether other sources come through, for the most part, up until we started doing these uh, CC channeling circles, and we've only done three at this point, um, we've always been in a setting where Jim has been leading the channeling circle. And so he would be receiving the contact first. And that then it sort of means that whoever Jim receives is the contact for the circle. And so when we uh, make that contact and challenge, it's always been uh, whoever Jim has connected to, for the most part, Kuo. And that uh, I think is also just built off of the fact that we're working with a lineage of expectation. You know, Carla developed this channeling practice. And if you go far back into the transcripts, she was getting all kinds of crazy contacts with like all sorts of different entities. But as time went on more and more, she kind of settled on just a few different sources and primarily Kuo by the end. And so I think that um, that's just kind of like what the crystallized channeling method of LL research is primarily connecting with Kuo. It could possibly change in the future, uh, especially with the uh, new CC channeling circles. We're kind of like, they're intended to break things up a little bit and see what else might be possible. And so there might be other types of contacts made besides Kuo. But uh, for the most part, it's just Kuo when we do the challenging, at least for me. Um, Kuo is the one that is there as a unified entity, and that is who uh, is challenging and meeting the challenge. Um, and I'll let uh, Gary or Trish answer the other part of your question and anything they have to add to that. Uh, yeah, Donna, it's good to see you again. Donna is a volunteer transcriber that helps to get the channeling into text for L research. And like Jonathan, we got to meet her at homecoming um, a couple months ago. Yeah, and in terms of uh, channeling intensives in the future, nothing on the docket uh, now, but there is a general background intent to try to hold something again. But as with all things, there is the barrier of or the obstacle of bandwidth and how little of it there is but um oh yeah and you you asked about zoom too and um we had explored that in the past but felt that uh um in person is the more appropriate route for the time being well and didn't that also have to do with how we uh perform like the banishing ritual like we are creating an actual yeah. in-person environment that we perform the banishing ritual within there's yeah. you know these safeguards and then when you start adding in other people's spaces even though they're not I mean we're tethered like virtually but not physically hmm. we don't know what that could bring that makes sense it's a great question uh did you have any follow-ups on that Donna uh, no I think that was it um thanks guys it was nice seeing you again good to see you Thank you. Uh, Rooney, I saw that you had a few questions uh, about that November 10th session, and I'm not sure if those questions were answered or not. If not, would you like to unmute your mic and do you have any questions still that you would like to ask? Uh, I see Rooney is here, but I see his mic is muted. Rooney, if you want to talk, you will need to unmute your mic. And I believe Rooney is calling us all the way from Copenhagen, Denmark, I believe. 
Uh, it doesn't seem to be happening, so I'm going to move on and let him join us later if he wishes. Uh, Shayla, did you have a question you would like to ask? Yes, thank you. Hi, everyone. It's lovely to see you, and thank you for being here. Uh, so my question is about the connection. After you do the channeling, I mean, in the progress of channeling, your consciousness is expanded, wider, and it's, you know, together with everything, uh, connected. When you close it and when you end it and you go and cook coffee, make dishes and, and such, how do you shift from this state to the other? How long does it last? How do you anchor yourself again in those energies? Or do you go throughout the days with, you know, there is one part of me still there? And also, have you ever or have you at the beginning maybe experienced this period of vertigos uh, and such because of the higher in streamings of energy? Thank you. Um, I guess in terms of like after we finish, for me personally, when I release a contact and it moves on elsewhere, um, there kind of feels... I don't, I don't want to call it like a contact high, but like, <laughs> uh, you know, I feel lighter on a physical level. I do feel like my, uh, my faculties, my abilities have broadened. I feel more alert, more connected. Um, and I, I don't know if I'm projecting here, but it, it seems to be kind of uh, a heightening of the group energy too. I feel like after we complete a channeling circle that there's that seems to be not just me personally but the group as a whole feels like it's operating in that way um and we tend to do except for the cc circles we're almost always in the evenings so i think the circadian rhythm kind of cuts off that like that feeling of contact high for me at least like I go to sleep and I wake up and I, I feel like normal Trisha again. So thanks. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, Shayla, I hope you got some rest um, of your recent outing. It's so good to see you. We get to meet Shayla in Prague. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, I won't divulge what your outing was. Um, Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, that's an interesting question. Uh, for me, I have difficulty shifting my consciousness generally into altered states of awareness. I have a really hard shell that's really hardwired for daily pragmatic reality. And I've I've tried uh, acupuncture, like I mentioned, ayahuasca, holotropic breath work, meditation, breathing techniques, uh, pranayama, etc. And um, I'm <laughs> I it's kind of been a source of frustration for me that I am this way, but I can only presume that it's not by accident, nor am I broken. Uh, however, I I designed my personality to serve in a specific way, and I can see how it is of benefit to LL research specifically, you know, my main calling in life, uh, because I have to handle a lot of pragmatic uh, practical information. And if I was shifting into mystical states pretty often, I think I would have a uh, great difficulty doing what I do. Um, so that said, in channeling, I'm not shifting into a profound state of altered awareness. I am getting sensations uh, at times, particularly I, I get really deep and I've described it before where I feel like I'm elongating. Um, and it's really hard to describe in spatial terms because it doesn't feel like a spatial phenomena. But somehow I feel, you know, I can feel my physical body is it's six feet or uh, two meters of dimension, but um, this energetically I'm expanding and it's so weird. Otherwise, um, given how subtle my experience is and how hardwired I am into ordinary reality and cognition, um, I just, uh, after the channeling, might feel a little invigorated or excited having done performed as an instrument, having participated with my loved ones, uh, you know, Trish, Austin, Kathy, and Jim, 
and be excited in that regard. But otherwise, it's it's a subtle um, the experience of channeling, and I shift right back into normal reality. How about you, Austin? Uh, yeah, thanks for asking that question, Shayla. We haven't talked about this specifically amongst ourselves, so it's interesting to hear uh, Gary and Trisha's experiences. Mm -hmm. For me personally, um, I spend a lot of the day before a channeling, especially when we do it in the evening times, in a very like conscious, intentional state. Um, I pray. Uh, a lot throughout the day and I think about the coming channeling and try to hold an intention so there's like a build-up throughout the day until the channeling and then when we get to the channeling it's like that's sort of the burst of what was being anticipated and then once it's done there's like a release and uh, for me it is a very kind of relaxing feeling like um, it's done uh, the energy is now able to be dissipated and kind of go back out into the world uh, this energy that I had been cultivating up to that point. And so um, it is a very pleasant feeling for me. And I also get similar sensations as Gary was describing during the channeling. Um, I think that I'm typically able to enter into that kind of altered state more easily than he is, but I do have a uh, elongated feeling of elongation, but like sort of spatial distortion in general. It's very hard to describe, but your eyes are closed. You're not seeing anything, but then I feel like things are shifting around me. Like my space is getting bigger and smaller. I'm getting longer and stuff like that. It's very strange to describe. Do you reckon this feeling of elongation is more physical or mental? Like, is it, it you, you think it's consciousness actually that you feel, you know, that it's getting wider and bigger and everything? Or is it more physical feeling? It's so hard to describe that I think the best way to say is it's kind of both. It's kind of like the link between both because there is a physical aspect to it. It's like, it feels spatial in a sense, but then uh, it's also like, I know my physical body sitting there. I don't actually feel my body getting bigger, but the my brain's interpreting it as like something is expanding and growing. So it could, I think it's like a link between both the consciousness and the physical. Sure. Thank you very much. That is so fascinating. Yeah, and what a wonderful question. Thank you for asking, Shayla. Uh, we are getting near the end of our hour and I did see a question from Aram. I saw uh, Daniel Steinmetz was asking where this session is that we've been referring to so often today. And in, in case you didn't know that, uh, it was posted on the LNL Research Facebook page, plug to the Facebook page and plug to Trisha, who I believe admins the LNL Facebook page. Uh, and I would assume it's also listed in the Conscious Channeling Library on the LNL website. Uh, so good plug for both of those things and great source information. Otherwise, I did see that Daniel Haddad had a question. Rooney, if he's available, uh, probably still has a question. And I did want to circle back to Prashanth to be able to ask a, another question. If there's anyone else who has a question they want to ask uh, this session, please make sure you type in in the chat window and let me know. And we'll make sure that you can do that. Otherwise, uh, Aram, did you have a question you wanted to ask? Would you like to unmute your mic and ask? Let's see, Aram, I believe your mic is muted. You'll have to unmute your mic. And looks like your mic is still muted in the lower left-hand corner of your Zoom window. Uh, let's see. Aram, looks like we're not connecting for some reason. Let me circle back to you afterwards in a minute. Uh, Daniel, are you still there? Did you have a question you would like to ask? Yes. No, I... Hi. Hi, everyone. Uh, I would like to ask because we never have a chance to talk about it. Uh, nutrition experience. Do you know anything you have to you or some crisis subject come back to the flight? Is there a special group that you was? Hey, Daniel, I believe your sound is cutting out. I don't think we're able to hear your question. Perhaps our internet connection is uh, spotty. Would you mind typing your question in that chat window and then 
uh, I could read it out loud if that would help your question to get heard. Otherwise, I, I don't think we're hearing the question. I, I, I managed to unmute. I was wondering if I could ask my question. Aram, yeah, go ahead. Okay. Hi, guys. Um, it's, it's nice to meet you all, and thank you for taking the time to answer our questions. Um, my question is about the sexual energy transfer, particularly, particularly around the green ray. Um, I feel like among some like spiritual communities, there's this idea about polyamory being like more evolved. And I'm wondering if the Confederation says anything about whether it matters, whether you're in a monogamous relationship or polyamorous, or, you know, does it, does it matter? The, the type of relationship, or is it more about um, the consciousness of the people involved? Great question mm -hmm. and big challenging um, topic. And as you highlight, topical too, and uh, relevant, because it is a modality that I think um, among that maybe the new age community is being explored more often, particularly in the form of polyamory. Um, my general sense is that any two entities, whatever their gender, however they identify, whatever their particular mode of relationship, um, so long as their hearts are open to that vibration of love, they, um, through intercourse, and which may not even be physical, but through that depth of intimacy can exchange energies between them. I mean, that's in essence what I understand to be a sexual energy transfer to be. Literally the, the energies in this closed system, seemingly closed system, transfer to the other person and their energies transfer back to me in a reciprocal exchange that enhances and benefits both entities which is in contrast to the negative energy transfer, whereby the negative entity is seeking to dominate, subjugate, and enslave, and take the power of the other entity. So one entity is diminished, the other entity's power is increased in the, in the negative, if it can be called a transfer, well, certainly. So that said, are there relationship configurations that are more conducive to supporting this transfer? And um, Ra does indicate that there is a bias toward the mated relationship. And the by mated, I take that to mean, you know, the intensive dyad, uh, whether you call that monogamous or not, two people working intensively together have a greater ability and efficiency to do that um, work in sexual energy transfer. I mean, and one just um, can consider how difficult relationship work is with just one other person and how it's a long, Trish and I can speak to this, <laughs> what a long journey of learning it is, learning to look into the mirror, learning to own one's own distortions um, and learning to be patient and tolerant and accepting and so forth. and. Um, uh, I don't have the final say on polyamory versus monogamy. Polyamory can offer its own benefits and its own um, pursuits and uh, can enhance the process in different ways. It can also dilute one's focus too. I think we actually had a quote channeling about this where they described how uh, that sort of configuration, one pitfall could be that the self doesn't fully confront the catalyst being offered um though the literature and the community on polyamory also describe a, a very ethical um framework that involves transparency honesty so that could really challenge the activation of the blue ray and the green ray and the many balances that make it even more complex when you have a, a three people or four people or or pod as i understand it um however in closing sorry um I take from the law of one that there is an indication of a more intensive efficiency in, um, in conducting sexual energy transfer and using that for the work of the adept to uh, penetrate the indigo ray. 
um, in a, an intensive mated relationship. Uh, sorry, Austin and Trish, it was longer than I intended. That's beautiful. That's a good question. That's a complicated question to answer. No, no doubt about it. Trisha, Austin, did you have anything to add to what Gary said? Austin? Uh, just a reiteration, the primary question being, you know, as the Confederation, would they agree with polyamory being a more evolved system of relationship and sexual relationship? I would say no, I don't think they would just consider it more evolved or less evolved. Um, and like Gary said, Ra hinted that monogamy uh, was imprinted, uh, just a hint of an imprint uh, for a reason, uh, for the type of catalyst that it would offer. But, you know, uh, all catalyst is catalyst. And I can definitely understand how somebody opening their green ray of universal love would be uh, tending towards polyamory. It makes sense to me. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Hey, uh, I'm looking at our clock and seeing we are probably past our usual hour time, but I do want to make sure that the folks who had questions to ask have a chance to ask the questions. Uh, Daniel did in fact type his question in the chat window and Daniel wanted to know how uh, did you experience your trip to Europe? Anything special you experienced? <laughs> Anything uh, that you took with you? Mm. This is uh, Daniel Hotep. Yeah. Oh, that trip was amazing. Uh, and thanks in part to Daniel as yeah. well. <laughs> yeah, that was it. It's always an incredible experience to meet other people who uh, resonate with this material. And it's extra special uh, to like take ourselves out of our familiar environments and <laughs> see people from all over the planet in person. So it was amazing. And it's a beautiful space too. And it's nice to get out of the US every once in a while. And hello to Noah and Thomas and Nadine. <laughs> um, it uh, was also special because uh, as you may be aware, there's that Prague channeling and there was a, a big leap for Austin, Trish and me. It was our first time channeling in front of other people, first time uh, channeling in front of a lot of other people and uh, at a gathering, no less, and outside of our own home in Louisville. So um, yeah, that was, and uh, getting to work with Voita and meet Shayla and Daniel and Johan. And yeah, it was so beautiful. Mm -hmm. And the, it, it's also amazing to see the how universal is the general um, orientation of the Law of One student. Like we had a bunch of different nationalities who uh, converged in Prague and the vibration was very much the same as we would experience here in the States, even though they have such different backgrounds. Mm. Fascinating. Austin, any reflections to share? Any special takeaways from your European adventure? everything they just shared and um it was also the prog gathering was our first public gathering since the the pandemic oh, yeah. began so that was a huge um it made us realize how much we had missed it and how important it was to gather as groups and to provide space for people seekers to gather uh is the the feeling of coming together as a group of seekers uh is not something you really experience anywhere else. And so it reminded us of that and how important that was. And uh, the other thing is just meeting people who are so dedicated to their own path of seeking and service, uh, people that we'd never met before, but also people that we interact with a lot digitally uh, and through email, the Voita, Shayla, and uh, everybody like that, that um, it, meeting them in person and just experiencing that spirit of dedication and service uh, in person is uh, very, very special as well. Very invigorating for us. So we really appreciate that kind of opportunity and it's just an honor to be able to do something like that. What a joy. Thank you for sharing that. And uh, thank you for the question. Uh, Rooney let me know that he is actually on a train <laughs> as we speak. So is not actually able to ask his question on mic. But uh, the question he typed in the chat window was a follow up to the discussion about the November 10th session just a week or so ago. He says, I'm curious if they could qualify the energy from the circle and their subjective perception compared to their circles with Jim being there, or maybe even when Carla was there as well. 
Any thoughts on how the energy may have felt the same or different channeling without Jim present? And maybe you spoke to this already, not sure if you have anything to add to what you said already. I think there's pluses and uh, minuses to both configurations. I mean, when we're working with Jim, we're working with somebody who's been channeling since 1982 and is so at ease with channeling and it feels effortless. And um, what comes through him feels powerful. He is an entity of, as Ra described, power to, you know, an, uh, archetypical purity. And um, there's there's a strength and an anchoring that he holds. And channeling in his living room is where Carla and Jim had been since 1984 when Don Elkins purchased the house. And every morning since then, so 365 days times almost 40 years, Jim has been performing the banishing ritual in that living room like clockwork because Jim is built to be a ritualistic person who repeats his patterns every day um and Carla and Jim like the vast majority of the LL transcript library on the website took place in that space and all most of our gatherings have been through that space and people who have come to visit LL research have imbued that space with their energy so there is no substitute not even a close second for that space it is magical and profound and beautiful and people who are sensitive uh unlike me come to the house and they can they report feeling that light glowing from some some distance away so there is all that strength and anchoring that that Jim provides and that that protection and purity to the contact that's a positive on on the flip side there's also a sort of um calcification too or a sense of um uh, what's the word I'm looking for like I don't know like like a rigidity almost to it and uh, less of a sense of being experimental or finding out who we are as channels outside of that space. So that's what the CC circle offers us. It's a, a chance to um, create our, our own protected and purified space, spread our own wings a little bit and see as um, a younger generation what we might do with channeling in honor of the lineage and tradition built by Carla. Uh, um, Don and Jim. However, the downside of that is the converse side of, or the positive side of channeling with Jim. You know, we, we're not channeling with Jim. Um, it's just us three. We're presumably generating less power than we would be uh, with Jim. So, um, did it feel okay. different in that respect? Did it feel like there was less energy or just different energy? Not less quantity. Uh, I would say there's there's subtle differences. Um, Jim, despite his power, uh, his being a being of power, he's also in his mid seventies too, and uh, fatigue visits him <laughs> in uh, these sessions, which is not uncommon because listening to a channel speak in a slow, monotone way is sleep inducing. I've had to, I've struggled myself too, but I don't know, Austin and Trish, what do you guys say? I'm interested in hearing Austin's take because, I mean, when we're with Jim, Jim receives the contact, but when we're in our CC circle, you receive the contact, Austin. So I don't know if that makes a difference. Um, yeah, I would say in terms of quality and quantity of energy and the, just the quality of the contact, I honestly don't feel much of a difference between the two spaces and the two different circles. There's a certain like invigoration of the experiment that's happening. But um, when we connect with Kuo and we're in the channeling circle, it feels pretty much the same to me. Uh, and it feels good. It feels good. Uh, so, and just want to reiterate something Gary said that like uh, Jim channeling with Jim in the intermediate circles and the public meditations, that's always going to be the primary channeling for us. That's always like the, what our main channeling is the, the CC circles that we're doing separate from that are secondary to that main aspect of channeling. Extracurricular. Yeah. They're extracurricular. Thanks. But it's nice that you're thinking ahead to the future and thinking in a broader scope of time and allowing for this to, to be able to continue. And I think that's just a beautiful thing. Uh, for those of us who don't know, uh, CC stands for what? <laughs> 
Uh, as CC is the, the first letter of our two home neighborhoods where Austin lives and where we live. We struggle with, we had a, a, a bunch of cool names. It's just that there is no precedent in the LL library for uh, naming the group. I can't remember. We had some funny ones too, but um, yeah, like if you look back to the archives, it's all like Sunday meditation, Saturday meditation. Um, so we had to kind of come up with something a little bit more anodyne. <laughs> nice. yeah. Would love to hear the names that she came up with. I'm sure they would be uh, entertaining for sure. Uh, but we could save that for another session. Trisha, did you uh, have any thoughts to add to what uh, Austin and Gary said? Um, yeah, I think I feel similarly to both of their um, their sharings. The, there's a difference in terms of there being more people uh, with Jim and usually with Kathy too. There's, I don't know, a perceivable difference in terms of the masculine feminine uh, between that one and the CC circle. Uh, not that it's ever not in balance. It's just a different energy signature. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I had something else to say to that, but I can't remember now. So it's all good. <laughs> It's nice to CC, we are meeting in the morning to feel say. fresher, whereas yeah. at gyms, it's the evening because of our Kathy's work schedule. Yeah, the difference in time uh, changes things. And we are also contending with a few more distractions when we do the CC channeling because it's usually here and we have five furry creatures that uh, like to make their presence known quite <laughs> often. So there's that additional. Thing. <laughs> nice. Yeah, thank you. I haven't thought about that. Yeah, daytime, morning versus evening, I would imagine makes a, a big difference. Hey, uh, I see Thomas did have a question he wanted to ask, and then I did want to double back to Prashant to be able to ask their last question before we wrap things up for today. Thomas, would you like to unmute your mic and ask? Hi, Trisha and Gary. Hi. Hello, it's been a while. <laughs> yes, of course. I just want to ask, I, I'm so blown away from, from your Prague experience with Trisha and Carla. And I, I only read it in, in the transcripts and heard it from Daniel and Jochen. I'm just curious, how does it feel or what did you see? Uh, I'm so blown away because of this female and, and male energies. It's quite interesting for me to to ask you <laughs> how how how. I don't know, how is the contact with Carla or, or what did you see or what did you feel? Yeah. Or... Ah! <laughs> oh, I know. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, so I guess in terms of what uh, I saw, at least in that experience, we were just finishing up uh, tuning and challenging. And I think literally people, Correct me if I'm wrong, like boy to you're already having people walk down the stairs. So people are starting to flood the space. And in that moment, I there's a sense of well, a few moments before, there's a sense that I'm not alone. And I look in my mind behind me, and there's Carla's face. And she's um I've only known Carla since she was bedbound. So I had an image of what I knew Carla to be, and when I turned around, it was not. It was young, it was strong, it was, yeah, just strength and confidence and wisdom. Um, and she kind of, there was a humor to that witnessing because she kind of made me, she gave me the sense that I don't know why you guys are so nervous, like chill out, <laughs> you're good, it's okay. Uh, I'm really proud of you. I got a sense of her being uh, honored and having a lot of pride for us being there, especially Austin and Gary, because they had worked in the office with her so closely. And it felt energetically kind of like she was just going to sit behind us the whole time and maybe have her arms around us. And uh, that felt really great because we were, I think we were all so extremely, I was extremely nervous at least. And uh, she just made sure that we knew that she was there and cracked a joke and helped kind of 
I don't know, break that tension. So, yeah. <laughs> what a beautiful story. That's, thank you so much for sharing. Mm -hmm. Thomas, did you have any follow-up questions? If you do, uh, feel free to unmute your mic. Otherwise, yeah, what a beautiful uh, story. And it's, it's, it's just one, one sentence. I'm, I'm, for me, it's a big topic because I, I just read yesterday, I think from you or some from the Seattle group, that this, uh, the female energy, it's a big problem for, for planet Earth. And I often forget about it. Yeah, you, you do your stuff and do your business and earn money and then you meditate. But it's so deep that there's nothing, nothing from the most people on Earth. And so I was, I don't know if it's right to say it like this, but I was blown away because for me, it makes total sense that Carla says, hey, <laughs> hello, um, it's good and come on. So I'm, I'm very yeah, excited about this. Can, Thank I, you. <laughs> can I say one thing to that? I Me? think it was really, to speak to that point, uh, in hindsight, it was quite perfect she showed up because our question in that channeling was about the divine feminine yeah. Yeah. and yeah. fostering that energy. And naturally she'd be the person to show up to like help us feel safe and uh, ready and supported because she was such a pillar of divinely feminine energy. Mm. So that's all. <laughs> well said. Thank you so much. And thank you for the question, Thomas. Uh, I'm going to turn it to Prashant. Thank you so much for uh, being thoughtful of others and letting others ask their questions before you asked a second question. But I do want to make sure you have a chance to do that. Prashant, would you like to uh, ask your second question? Thanks, guys. Uh, so I want to make it quick. Uh, so the question what I had was uh, in relevance to the evolution from the third to the fourth density, where we talk about we'll be moving from the chemical bodies to light bodies, right? So uh, what would happen to other densities such as plants and animals which are there? So the reason why I ask this is because there is so much of stuff where we talk about healing in terms of Mother Earth, right? And uh, uh, but if you look at planets like Venus, etc., so it doesn't support other densities apart from they apparently say third density is not supported, which means I assume second or probably the first density is also non-existent there. So do you think we are going through a similar fate with respect to Earth where we might not have uh, plants and animals maybe a few uh, thousands of years down the line? Uh, just out of... Uh, uh, this is not straight from plugged out of uh, any text, but just out of curiosity, just a line of thought. Thank you. Austin, would you like to speak to that first? Yeah, very interesting question. I think just my personal theory based on everything that Ra said, everything Kuo said, um, I do think Ra indicated that second density and first density would still be active on Earth as we were in fourth density. So as fourth density beings, we will still be inhabiting an Earth that looks very much like the Earth that we inhabit now with plants and animals. And Kuo has expanded on that further and that we as fourth density beings, as a fourth density population, will have a relationship with the plants and animals. And that relationship will involve a lot of restitution and healing uh, that uh, has been made necessary because of how we've treated that aspect of our planet in third density. So uh, at least in fourth density, I do believe that those aspects of our planet are still active and uh, will still be um, on a planet like that. But as we go up in densities and maybe as the biosphere of Earth becomes less viable for any kind of reason, um, maybe the experience of higher densities does not involve that kind of interaction, at least on Earth. But um, it's a good question, fun to think about. I don't know uh, if there are any clear answers in the material about that. Gary, Trish, anything to add? Uh, I don't. Am I using the bathroom? No. Um, I just heard our toilet run, and the only other person capable of that is our dog, which would be quite a surprise. Uh, and which would speak speaking of second density entities, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> evolution of second density. Yeah. Also, a fascinating question to consider. I'm not sure if Austin said it or not, but. Um, Ra does indicate that third density will cycle again on this planet as well. So there will be for second, third, and fourth 
if I understand correctly, coexisting, how fourth density interacts with first and second, much less third, if they do interact at all, once there's a third density population on this planet again, I'm not sure. But yeah, I think that's the only piece I would add. If I remember correctly, they said there needs to be a transition time without third density so that fourth density entities can learn how to veil themselves from third density entities right. so they don't yeah. violate free will. Does, uh, am I remembering that correctly? Mm -hmm. Yes. Trisha, anything to add? Well, I want to thank all three of you uh, for being here, for volunteering uh, your time so so generously. I wanted to thank everyone who's joining us on this call. Uh, uh, Austin, Gary, Trish, were there any last thoughts, reflections you wanted to share before we wrap up for today? Just a quick note of gratitude and love. Thank you so much for holding this space, and thanks everybody for being here and holding space too. And um, I, uh, Daniel was on earlier. I'm not sure if he's still on anymore, but he uh, co-hosted us in Berlin. We had a small event and it was fine. Trisha's first time finally joining Austin and me and we loved it so much. Thank you, Daniel. And Voita, yeah, he's still here too. Um, he's our counterpart in Prague who um, leads up the, the Prague event. And uh, Shayla is a translator and Donna is a transcriber. <laughs> this is someday Shayla. <laughs> and uh, Morris and Linda are dear friends, and Morris is a member of the board, and um, you're all of support in so many different ways. Uh, thank you all. It's amazing hearing your questions. It's kind of mind-blowing to me that uh, our lives intertwine in this way. I, uh, you're relating to this work, and our energies are being exchanged, and we're all part of this big, broad mission to lighten the planetary vibration. Uh, Jonathan, thank you so much for your, you. your stamina and perseverance and holding these sessions and inviting us. It's an amazing honor. Uh, speaking of Shayla's question of shifting after channeling, I think I'm going to be high after this session for a bit. Yep. How do you do? Uh, yeah, thank you, everyone, for being here. Thank you, Jonathan, for hosting this. and. I was incredibly nervous and I'm still a little bit nervous, but I'm so thankful the, the group energy has been very warm and welcoming. And thank you for facilitating this, Jonathan. Yeah. You bet. I hope you uh, join us again sometime down the line when the three of you are able to make time in your schedule. Uh, in the meantime, uh, heartfelt thanks to all three of you for all you have done and continue to do in service to others. Thanks. Heartfelt thanks to all our friends at L1L Research for all they've done in service to others. Thanks for everyone who's joining us on the Zoom call for being here. It was really a delight to be able to connect across the planet this way. There's something okay. very special and magical and non-local about the whole thing. And it would not be the same if uh, each and every one of you were not here. So thank you all for being here and all you do is service to others. And thank you for everyone who's watching this on YouTube at some other point in space, time, time, space. Looking forward to doing this again. In the love and light of the one infinite creator, Adonai. In the love and the light. Amen. Bye, everyone. Bye, guys. Love you all. Love you all.